is Behind the Games from NewOverlords.com, where we seek creators of all kinds to find out what's behind our favorite games. With your hosts, Jeff and Seema. I just got back from PAX East, where I spent four days meeting with studios, trying new games, and seeing what's out and what's coming next. This episode is going to cover a ton of highlights and shout outs to people, studios, and games that came to our attention. It was super fun. So this is no no guest today, Seema, no interview. So I'm just going to be speaking at you. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to be like interviewing you and hearing about your experience. Yes, yes. And it was great. It was good. So PAX East is about the same as it was last year. So I was there last year as well. It's not maybe not as big as it was in the olden days and maybe not as big as PAX West, but definitely big and full. I was also joined by... John Maloney, a.k.a. Corley, who is a community member of ours. Right. Was and he was, the... he was there last year, but it, this is new to him being part of the team. Right. And he's been there many years. So he was the first one who, back when we got started a year ago, said, you know what you should do? You should come out to PAX East because he's gone to PAX East by, you know, at least yeah. a half a dozen yeah. times or more. I forgot, but it was his idea. And he helped me figure out how to navigate the show, what to what to do to get the most out of it. I brought him and we teamed up with him as part of the New Overlords team. And he helped this year very directly in walking the show floor, talking to studios, reviewing games, checking things out, adding things to our list, trading notes so that we would have a good list of, of things to both queue up for future interviews, which we'll be having throughout the middle, whole middle of this year. And a bunch of things to talk about today in the highlights. So we will go through about 10 major highlights and a bunch of shout outs. In fact, I'm going to start with a couple shout outs and we'll end with some some bigger ones that I wanted to, to, to talk about as well. But yeah, to kick it off, what was really fun, I felt, was I got to see some people that I had seen in the past, some developers that are working on some games. In fact, it was interesting. I, di I didn't even realize this until I was thinking back and looking at my video. The three that I had, three, three of the main ones that I had met in the past and two that we had had on the show were all lined up right next to each other. And oh, there's really? Like 100, yeah, there's like 100 indies and there's like booths with like 20 indie, you know, one thing on each screen. And Jess from Folklore Games with Spiral, Kristen and Joe Sharaf from Inktail Games with Aaron's Gift. Inktail Studios with uh, Aaron's Gift. We interviewed both of those. And then one that we featured last year was Morgan and David from Small Games with Hides, Haunt, and Seek. Yeah, there were one, two, three, right, <laughs> right, right next to each other. So I got to, to say hi to them, uh, catch up with Jess. We had folklore. So if anyone has not seen that video in our interview with Jess and Mikhail, it was amazing. And Spiral is this really interesting dive into memory loss as a theme with a really be beautiful game that uh, goes along with it. They are a little bit closer to release. So they were there sort of showing off their, their latest as their last, one of their last stages before release. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, Kristen and Joe as well, Inktail, Aaron's Gift. Again, that march towards release with a lot of these studios. They're getting a little bit closer and a little bit closer. They're hoping to get it out relatively soon as well. So that was great. Uh, Morgan and David on Small Games Hide, Haunt, and Seek. You can see a little bit of that in more detail in our last video. We hope to get them on the show, actually. I, I, I traded some notes with Morgan even before this. They've done a lot of work with their game Hides, Haunt, and Seek because it's a, it's a two-player game, one where you're almost like a ghost detective, and it's Disney's Haunted Mansion style of a game. And the second player is the poltergeists. You're like setting traps and you're setting, you know, you're, you're, you're the ghost creating the spooky experience for the ghost hunter that's, that's in the house. And it got a lot of interest this round. It, they've gone through a lot of development and iterations. It's looking really good. Um, that seems so, kind of unique. It is. It's quite unique. It's, it's one of those unique games where you kind of need to have two people. Uh, it's also thematically and stylistically really kind of cool. Uh, very, it's, it's sort of that fun, uh, uh, stylized haunted mansion style and mm -hmm. not like a horror game. Right. Which is right. nice. 
one other that we'll talk about when we get into the top 10 highlights, because it's even evolved even more and getting a lot of attention right now is 30XX and Chris King. So I'll save that for just a second. Okay. I, we picked out randomly 10 that came to our attention as highlights. And there was many more than this that we could have chosen. And we'll even, as I said, I'll even do some shout outs afterwards as well, but wanted to try, try to limit it to 10. So what you're going to get now is 10 highlights that represent things that really caught our attention, studios that we, we really liked talking to, and a variety of games. So you'll sort of get what that variety looks like as we go through these. So number one, not to bury the lead, but I had a lot of fun. In fact, I had skipped it when I got to the show because it seemed like such a big deal was Cult of the Lamb. So Cult of the Lamb had one of the biggest, most amazing booths. It was also one of the busiest booths on the whole floor. But I got to meet the a couple of heads of the studio, like the creative director from Massive Monster, the company that's the, the studio that's putting out the game. And they are not big. They're a little indie studio. They, you know, they've got like 20, 25 people. I met uh, one of their lead developers and talked to him for a while, Anthony. I met their head of, of social media and I met their their creative director, Julian. Uh, and Julian was great and hilarious and awesome. Uh, I've got some some video of Julian who was sort of really making making as much of a spectacle uh, out of out of the show as they could on this theme of Cult of the Lamb. Right. They really went all the way, I can see. And I'm kind of curious about this game, too, because the title of a cult of the lamb and then um, relics of the old faith seem kind of uh, yeah yeah Lovecraftian, so, but then the art is very adorable. It is the cutest, most charming murder simulator, <laughs> yes. sac human you know sacrificing your followers and you know <laughs> simulator that you can get. And it, it looks is. like your character is a lamb. Too. It is. You are the lamb. You are the lamb and it is it is your cult. And you okay. so it's almost a little bit survival-ish and you build up a cult of followers and you bring in the followers know. and and then there's a little bit of you like you have to go on off on these little almost dungeon crawl. You gotta go fight some bosses. Sometimes you need to sacrifice some followers so that you can power yourself up. It's gotta be done. Uh, sometimes it, some of your followers aren't, you know, getting converted to your cult mo as effectively as they should be. So, uh, you sacrifice them <laughs> <laughs> as one does when you're a cute little lamb who's building up a, up a cult and being run by dark I like gods. I, the lamb even has a little jingle bell. Yeah. Yeah. Very, so very, very cute. They even had at one point at the show, uh, a, a full life-size, you know, person in a costume version of that lamb walking around. They had hourly sacrifices going on. The, the whole middle of the booth was set up as an altar and people were bringing like drawings that they had done and like offering them up to the, to the lamb and <laughs> oh, that's like <laughs> setting them up on the altar. Yeah, I like it. It. Was, it was one of the most interactive, fun booths out there and a great team. So this team, so Devolver was the publisher. Devolver did the booth. In fact, when the Massive Monster team got there and they saw this thing, they said, you know, I, I did not, Holy mackerel. I did not ex expect this. <laughs> the, the way he talked about it reminded me of the scene from Spinal Tap when, but when it was the opposite, when, when they had the set for Stonehenge on the stage and it ended up being 24 inches tall yes, instead of yes. 24 feet tall. Yes. <laughs> but this was kind of the opposite for them. You know, they, they were, they were thinking this little booth and it was 24 feet tall and giant. And that's, that's what they got. Did you get a chance to play this one? I have tried it before. So I, I didn't play a lot at PAX and okay. I tend to not play a lot of things at PAX because you don't I'm want to give to up to people. You right. You don't want to give up prime talking time. Yes. Talk, talk, talk. That's, that's me. Uh, so this was, this is a great one. I really hope that we're going to get to talk to Massive Monster and get Julian on the show. We'll, we'll see that if we can awesome. swing that. I'm, I'm really fascinated. I asked him about it a little bit, but. This idea of going from a indie studio, they've done some other games, and then having one get this giant, what that does to you. So we'll, we'll get into that. Next up, a company called Rat Loop Games out of Canada. I think they're Montreal. They have a game coming out called No Love Lost. And this game I was fascinated by in, in a couple different ways and the studio. So I, 
I really like the studio. I talked to James Anderson, the game director. I talked to Brittany Brewster, the QA, uh, one of the QA leads who also does is now doing some development on the project. The game itself is really stylistic and cool looking. It's got cell shading as part of the style of the game. And that's one of the things that as I've been experimenting and learning how these game engines work, I've played with post-processing cell shading exactly uh, in not as beautiful as this, but I've, I've turned, I've implemented this uh, as a as sort of little practice project. So, and when I saw it like sort of done professionally, it, it, I, I just really liked it. I like the style. The game itself is sort of a cross between Island Expeditions and the, the battle style of Overwatch. So you're, there is, it's PvPVE. And you could do it all as PvE. It's two teams. So you do, you're going to queue up against another team. And I think it's teams of four. And you could do it almost as you do if you remember how Island Expeditions work. Yeah, I do. You got to go. You could just go off and, and go and hunt down the, the. There's like a spirit currency that you're sort of gathering and you're like fight, fighting little mini bosses or m like sort of mining nodes. Uh, battling against the environment and there's little ads coming out. You could just do that. The two teams could sort of race to do that. And then you need to get on the ship at the end. Could one of uh, the teams be an AI? I don't know if they've implemented that that way yet. Okay. So this is in development. Uh, so they probably have an opportunity to do that. Implementing that kind of AI is quite challenging. So I don't know if they'll do that right out of the gate, but that would be great, obviously. Uh, and that's some, one of the ways that Island Expeditions worked and made that work well. So are they must be planning to host servers and stuff then for this? Yes, yes. I uh, either that or it, it might. I think, I think the model was uh, peer to peer. One person hosts a server and everybody. Jumps oh, on. okay. I think that might be. How so you have be. to have friends to play this game. You may. You may have to have friends. So that's going to rule us right out, yeah, isn't you're it? Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but. Brittany was amazing. James was amazing. The style I re that really caught my eye and the 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 feel of the gameplay. I liked Island Expeditions. I thought it was a cool thing. So to yeah. have that kind of little arena, 4v4, get in there, do some things, have it a be, to be a PvE versus a PvP spin. There's definitely some fighting going on. If you should look at some of their dev videos, you can do that. You sort of get into a choke point at the very end. We need to jump jump on the ship as when the round ends. Uh, so it's, it looks really fun. I think it's going to be a hit. So that was a fun one. I like their hats. Yes. They have very good. They, oh, well, you know, you get a good a game with good hats and that provides <laughs> lots of opportunity for, for expansion, doesn't it? <laughs> the next studio was a studio from Australia. So Massive Monster, who does Cult of the Lamb, is from Australia. Oh, and okay. Prideful Sloth, who was down the aisle a little bit, was also from Australia. I think they're from Queensland. So I don't know that they're necessarily very close to each other. It's not like, you know, Australia is a whole country. I did. Right. And it's a big I one. Did, <laughs> I did say to Julian, oh, Prideful Sloth is in, in <laughs> you... Australia too. Do you know them? <laughs> right. I didn't say, I didn't say go that far, but oh, you're from Australia. You must know yes. these guys. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But he was, he did look him up right away. He was like, oh, they are from Australia. I'm going to go check them out. Again, this was a studio and a game that's a little bit different, a, a little bit interesting. And Cheryl Vance, the director, is an industry veteran. She's been around for a while. She's one of the co-founders of the studio. She was really, really cool. And she took me aside and spent extra time with me. We sat down. She walked me through the game. The game itself is a cool little city builder. So it, now I might say city builder, but the style of it kind of looks like Animal Crossing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's in very fact, that's what I was wondering when I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of chill. It's kind of cozy, uh, very, you know, like pastel colors. I think it's going to be a really accessible game, but it is a city builder. So what you're doing is you know, with almost with some sort of like the survival crafting elements, yeah. you don't have to survive. But you are building, you're sort of collecting resources and you're building your little city. And as you progress, you can have the townspeople, you can sort of like hire them and they can do some of the jobs. If you need to go collect a resource, you can ask them to do it. If you have fun collecting that kind of resource, like chopping down the trees, you can keep doing that. So it's a, a nice mix of 
building your city out, arranging the infrastructure, building little shops, uh, still collecting the resources. You can see fishing. There's little aliens that come and visit. There's but it, so very cute looking. You ride your bike around the little town. She had me ride ride the bike around the uh, to so get around I, the town. Very I cool. see that in the picture of the booth they had um, controllers out. So is do you think this is controller only? Good question. She gave me a controller to play it. I don't think it'll be. I, I don't see a reason why it would have to be controller only though. Uh, and I, I believe it's multi platform out of the gate, as many of these things were. Uh, and more and more games are starting to be. In fact, that was a just a quick aside, a note that Corley came away with and made made sure we sort of realized as we were going through is more and more games out of the gate are cross platform. Every platform, Steam, Epic Games, Xbox. Yeah, I see. Uh, Go Go Town Android. is on, it, you can wish list it on, or it's to be announced on Steam. So to me, that says PC available. Yes, definitely PC available. Uh, but even games on Steam that are PC available might be controller first. Oh. So we'll have to see how they... Good point. I've been assuming keyboard mouse would work. Oh, she I, just I got... I bet it will. Yeah. I bet it will. Cute little... It is adorable. Cute little trailer, animated trailer. Uh, but again, Prideful Sloth, very cool. I don't pick up swag. I don't pick up like buttons or anything at a studio, but because I was there to, sort of as, you know, as, as media... Uh, <laughs> talking with Cheryl for a while, she gave me a little media gift bag. Uh, I was very happy about it. It had little buttons and stickers and, and it had this in it. So I don't know if oh. anyone out there is from Australia. I asked for input from a couple of our Australian friends and haven't gotten it yet, but I, this is Australian candy and I cannot wait to dig into that, but I'm not going to do it during the show because <laughs> <we're> gross. <laughs> So good one, good one, fun one. And I really hope we get to talk to Cheryl more. And oh, and, Sh and Bailey Itsumita was there with Cheryl. Bailey is from Stride PR. So Stride, who oh, we right. interviewed on the show a while back, uh, Stride is all over the, all over PAX and all over the games industry. So they're getting bigger and bigger. And Cheryl mentioned that Stride is big in Australia for, for indies in Australia for whatever reason. She said Stride's kind of Stride for PR kind of has the Australian market tied up for whatever that means. So that's fun. I got to catch up with my Stride contacts on that. So great one. So that show, I mean, that game Go Go Town has fishing and aliens. It does. And little bikes that you can ride around on and townspeople that you can boss around. You're the mayor is how that works how that one works okay so next up taking a little bit of a of a turn in something that's really unique and really interesting with the way they presented it at pax in a little six by six booth there were the two leads from this studio out of canada and it's just it's just a few people working on this sura and saif were there one is the creative director and one is the developer what they had set up for this game. So let me describe the game first. So the, the game is a very artistic little uh, uh, puzzle game. So it's very artistic scenes. And then you're just a little character that wanders through the world and needs to solve little puzzle, puzzles to progress from place to place and, and reveal a little bit of a story uh, as, as that goes along. So you've, you've seen games like this before where it's, you're just sort of, You've got a static scene and you're like stepping on the uh -huh. lever to raise yourself up to the, to the next part of the map and getting yourself, you know, getting yourself through where you need to go. Uh, so very beautiful from that perspective. And the reason it's so beautiful is the creative director there, uh, which you can, uh, if, you, if you see the video, you can see in the booth, painted all of the backdrops. And she had a portfolio open that you could page through all of the scene backdrops for the game that were all hand painted, individually painted by her acrylic on canvas. So she paints them all first. She paints from scene to scene to scene and none of the scenes repeat as you sort of progress through the game and the story gets told. And then what she did is she brought her paints and her easels and everything to packs and painted live the whole time for four days. Crazy. I'm so watching her do it right now. It's amazing. So she was doing that. She was painting live for, for four days. She was painting four people. And then she did a thing at, at one point, I think, I think on Saturday, where 
she painted a baseline bit of, of a canvas and then invited as people came by to grab a brush and add something to it. Uh. So I have a video of that, or you can look it up on their site. The name of this game, I, I don't think it was too clear, is Unleaving. So it's unleaving.com, U-N-L-E-A-V-I-N-G.com. And orangutangmatter.com is the studio name. But really, really eye-catching, really, you could just sort of see the talent as she was sort of quickly painting these, these backdrop scenes. And very eye-catching from a media perspective. There was definitely cameras crowded around her quite, quite often throughout the show. Uh, deservedly so. Beautiful stuff. I really like that when it's something different and that you, you can really see someone's art come through. And this is very direct. You know, it's, it's the arts just right there on the screen. And it doesn't look like every other game. Yeah. Because it's very unique. It's, yeah. So that was excellent. And it looks like it's a puzzle game, like a, like a. a very chill puzzle game. Yeah. So mm-hmm. like take, take your time, ex, ex, not really explore, but ex, explore the scene so that you can figure out the puzzle. And it's, you know, you move this, you move the cart over here, you step on this and then you jump up to this part and you. Then you, then you get up to the bluff and you move on to the next scene. Uh, that, that kind of game, which can be really cool. Next game, again, very different direction, very different kind of game. Uh, this game, the studio's name is SignalspaceLab.com. And the ga- name of the game is Every Day We Fight. And this is, for people that are familiar with the, these kinds of games, this is an XCOM style game. So it's turn-based, squad-based. You have this little squad of characters. It's three characters. You're sort of placing them in the, in the scene during your turn. You get a couple actions that you can execute in the scene. And then the aliens that, you're, that are invading your town get to take their turn and they shoot back at you. So it's basically you're shooting at them, setting little, you know, shooting off bombs. They're shooting at you. Turn-based, turn-based, turn-based. That's kind of what XCOM is. I got interested in this when I saw a press release for Every Day We Fight uh, because it looked like an interesting, well done, well yeah. executed game. And if you watch the video that they have, the trailer, there was this guy who's the creative director named Avi Winkler and Avi's narrating the, the trailer. So they, they show off the, the game, they show off the, the stuff, but Avi put himself in the beginning of the trailer in his office with stuff on his shelves, like kind of the kind of stuff that I have here in in my studio here, but cooler. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the kind of thing that that we that made me go, all right, I, I, I get who Abby is and we're going to have to meet up with Abby. I'm going to have to talk to Abby because he's he looks about, you know, maybe my age. He's got. Back to the bunch of Back to the Future paraphernalia on the on the shelves, which I, I thought was was fascinating for for it to go there. Star Wars stuff, uh, Predator, a, a bunch of different things. He's got the license plate for Out of Time. Uh, he's got a full size Boba Fett uh, standing behind him. So, yeah, I emailed Avi beforehand and said, "I like <laughs> I like the cut of your jib," <laughs> uh, and. And he'd send me a couple notes back and forth. I said, yeah, we're going to be at PAX. Great. Uh, I didn't even realize they were going to be at PAX at that point. Uh, so I was, I'm going to, okay, I'll catch up with you at PAX. I did. Caught up with Avi. Really interesting person. Very excited about uh, the, the game that they're developing. And they have put some different twists into it too. So if, if you're a fan of these kinds of XCOM style games, they've done some extra things to differentiate it and set it apart and make it, maybe make it a little bit more interesting. You're definitely part of the action. You can take a couple extra actions during your turn. That's that's somewhat unique. You can like lean out of windows to to get a better angle and a shot on you know, you know with a sniper rifle, and then during the enemy's turn, uh, you c- you get like an extra action, a defensive action that you can execute during uh-huh. the enemy's turn that it kind of like pops up. So you're part of the action. It's not just like you take your turn and then you walk away because the the game's going to play out, which the way some of those games work. They wanted it to be an active experience even during the enemy, uh, the enemy turn and not just like some plain cutscene. You do that, get that feel. It seems quite polished so far. The, the theme, the story is a resource has been discovered. This is about the, uh, it's uh, 1930s, 1940s oh. Earth. Uh, so you can see they're using like flint, flintlock rifles. Uh, 
aliens come, they discover some resource that they decide that they want. And what they do is when that resource is discovered, they drop a dome over the town or area or wherever it is that this resource was discovered that freezes everyone in place, except, except for a few people that for some reason aren't getting frozen. And these three people that you get to have as part of your squad are just three random people. So they're not like, it's not a band of brothers. One guy is like a, an ex school teacher. One, one woman is a scientist. One other guy is a mechanic, I think. And they don't necessarily get along, but they're sort of like thrown in this together. So they, you like get to reveal parts of their story. If, if you see in the graphics, the guy who's the school teacher is just like a, you know, just like a middle-aged dude wearing a sweater and he's got like a bolt action rifle and they're, they're going to, you know, they're, they've decided they're going to defend the earth. Uh, so fun, fun little characterization of what's going on there too. I thought that was really interesting. Great one again. I hope to talk to Avi more. Maybe we'll get Avi on to, to talk about the game and the development as well. And more about what's on his shelves. We like that conversation. Another one steps in a slightly different direction. Uh, a f- another favorite of ours, who we did t- feature last time on the wrap-up from PAX West, is Battery Staple Games and 30XX. Chris King is the founder and lead. I did spend extra time with Chris. In fact, I was off looking at some other booth, I think the Poland Indies, which I'll do a shout out at the end for. Uh, and someone was like standing next to me, also looking at the games. And he looks over and he goes, hey, you're Jeff, aren't you? I'm like, Chris, good to see you again. I had been past his booth, but he was obviously quite busy. 30XX is a Metroidvania. So it's pixel, it's pixel based, but you're picking up weapons and you're getting yourselves through the level and a little bit of platformy and, but And then getting power ups that you can take back to previous parts of the level and teleport back and forth to 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 blast your way through the game. Little little shooter, pixel platformy kind of fun game. The twist, which which is getting them a lot of attention right now, and is I think going to be really big this summer for 30XX franchise. It's been out for a while now. It's got a couple expansions. Is they're adding uh, level editing. What this is going to allow is going to allow anyone any player to create your own levels for 30xx add them to a library like a public library that's going to be somewhat curated and you know to make sure there's not garbage in there and and he said it's going to be curated as an algorithm so that it's going to be rated for how you know how people like thumbs up your 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 content and is it is it good and does it does it (laughs) Is it well formed? Does it work? Can people actually finish your level so that you'll be able to filter when you go to the library of all of these player made levels that get created to say, I, you know, give me, give me only the top, the cream of the crust, the top of the best. I want to play a couple of those or give me the worst of the worst. And I want to go, <laughs> I want to go check those out and, and, and see what people have done, see what crazy things people have done. A lot of media attention again. And Chris is a really interesting guy. Uh, I've traded some notes with Chris. We've tried to get Chris on the show before and we'll, we'll manage it at some point, but it just hasn't worked out yet. And very interesting person the way, with the way he started Battery Staple Games. So hope, hope, to, hope to hear more nice. and all the success that this game has gotten it deserves because it is, it is fun and well-formed for the kind of game that it is. Next up, as we're cranking through here, we're doing pretty good on time. I'm, I'm, I know I'm kind of like whipping through here Simo, That's good. But I like it. Make, making it happen. Uh, next one was a late one that caught my eye because there was just sort of like a little indie game in a, in a little booth. And there was, again, there's like a hundred of these. So it's very, very difficult, even in four days, for me to get around the whole show floor and see all of them. This did end up catching my eye. And then when, for, for two reasons. So then I sat down and talked to the, to the lead. His name is Hubert Bibrowski. Uh, and the name of the company of the studio is newsomatic.com and Astronomics. And they've made a couple games and Astronomics is this new game that they've got coming out. And the way this works is you're a little robot and you've got like a little mothership and you're in your little mothership and asteroids come floating by in space. And these asteroids, as they come floating by in space, you take a little shuttle out to the asteroid and then it becomes a, almost like a Factorio style game where you need to, uh, you need to harvest resources off the asteroid. And the asteroids are floating by your mothership. And if they, you, 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 you can only be on them harvesting so resources. Long. Yeah. 
and, until they get out of range. Early game, when you don't have very many tools available to you, you will be harvesting the resources by hand. You have like a little, you know, you've got like a little uh, grappling laser tractor beam that you get to grab pieces of ore and sh bring it over to your shuttle and get it beamed up. Later game, you're getting more and more sort of like drones and machines and conveyors, and you're going to set up little chains of production on the asteroid in the limited time you have available to harvest more and more and more, the better you get and the more upgrades you get. Very this interesting. Is, it is very interesting. It's, it's very stylistic. It's very unity looking, but, but well, well done art. And, and sort of like simplistic art, but in that way, it's going to be able to work on a lot of platforms and a lot of places. It's really cool looking. The concept, uh, I don't want to say that like um, I invented this concept <laughs> <laughs> because they've been working on it much longer than when I thought it up, but I did think this up. I love this idea. And I, you know, as I've been like brainstorming, what would be a cool game to say, see what, and, and what, what, what would be a cool game for somebody to make? I thought up a version of this, not exactly like this, and they've probably done it better than, than I was thinking of, but this idea of asteroids in space and a mix of like the survival genre, but with asteroids in space, you got uh -huh. asteroids. And so this is less survival and more of that manufacturing chain factorio style uh, kind of game. But I recognized it when I saw it. I was like, hey, I love this idea because I had this idea. And then there's uh, this part of it too it looks like where you're are you trying to get home to earth are you yes. trying to get to earth like the tagline the only home you've never known come home for the very first time yes so and this is a thing that i ask of all the studios when i'm sort of exploring their games is what's the journey you know where where does it go what's what's you'd like the story that's either being told how does the game end does it go on forever or whatever so the journey here, and you're playing it sort of like in these like rounds and, and waves and these multi-hour playthroughs, but it's a playthrough. The idea is you're going to these asteroids, you're using all of these drones and robots to harvest the asteroids because Earth is now, you know, sort of like locked down, you know, the, the Beltas are out in, <laughs> out in space and it's very expensive, very, very expensive to live on Earth. So what you're trying to do is build up enough wealth and resources so that you can buy your way to sort of like retire on Earth. Uh, so that's that's the little story. And that's how the rounds progress. That's the end game of what you're trying to achieve by collecting all of these resources. Good, good to have an objective. That good looks to have very an interesting to me. Again, low key, uh, chill at your own pace, harvest some asteroids. You get in a little hankering to jump on an asteroid. And I mean, there's a little bit of urgency because the asteroids are floating by, but you get better and better at it and you don't have to get everything off of the first asteroid and you don't lose by not harvesting the asteroid quick enough. So really well done. And it, I think well executed from a both a theme and then a game loop perspective in that way. All right. Now we get to, and there were a few of these, and this was one of the one of the better ones. And I'll mention a couple others that are early in development. I thought they were a little too early to to really feature as one of the one of the top ones that I'll do a shout out to at the end. But survival games, we did get a handful of survival games at PAX East this year. I saw almost none of them at PAX West. There was there's a couple that were close to to survival. There was some stand, you know, some basic. Uh, genre centric survival games that I got to check out. And this one I actually played. This one is called Wild Mender by Muse Games. A couple things on this. It's another studio and team that I really, really liked. Uh, they were very cool, uh, nice people. And even more so than the team, I'm going to do a special shout out after I get through this top 10. Kiwali, Kiwali the, uh, the publisher, was just amazing. So there's a couple of people from Quali. I'll, I'll talk about them at the end as well. So I, I like the idea of these bigger publishers sort of collecting up and becoming bigger and bigger and driving the industry forward, especially for indie games. But Wild Mender itself is a survival game. It's not a, it's, it's not a, a multiplayer one, not like Coreborn, but in the way that you need to get out into the world and survive, it's a little bit like that. What you're doing though is instead of like, building a base and a building and like defending that building, 
you're building a garden and the garden is basically repairing the biome in a particular area. And then you're expanding out and you're mending the wild, basically wild mender. Oh. So you've got your little character and you go out and you got to pick up some sticks and pick up some rocks and build your little base bench. And you're picking up these seeds and flowers and each of these major zones and biomes has like a, an ancient spirit that, that guides and, and looks over it. And you need to, you need to like fight some creatures too, to get some of the resources, but you're trying to mend these areas. You're trying to bring them back to life. The, they've had all the life sucked out of them. They're been, they've been, uh, they're somewhat desolate in a lot of ways. Um, they've not only been decimated, they've been destroyed a hundred percent in some cases. <laughs> Looks like you might get some little helpers along the way too. Yeah, I think you can pull up little team members, and I'm not positive. I, I, I'm not positive about the multiplayer. And again, this is in development, so they could be ex expanding it as well. Uh, oh no, no, it. I take that back. Now I do remember because I did play it. It is multiplayer. You get on a server, and there are other people around also, and you can go. And oh. you're all kind of like working in this world to to mend these biomes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, I, I do remember as I was looking out across the map, I was seeing like a little character markers for people out there. It's not competitive. There's not, there's no fighting of the other players. Uh, in fact, it's probably more cooperative than anything because you're all working together to, to mend the world. And the zones get progressively more challenging and more difficult as you get out and they sort of like expand into the other areas. Uh, stylistic, uh, but well, you know, very artistic, great studio, very engaging uh, with the fans and uh, taking input and seeing what they can do to improve. One of the best, best formed versions of these that I saw out there, uh, there were, there was a couple others that were, that were pretty close, but survival, survival genre, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm liking that lately. So great one. Wild Mender. I mean, they Can't even put survive. Goes as a word in their trailer explore grow survive yeah there's like the water meter and the health meter and you gotta you know keep drinking water and don't don't die <laughs> which is recommended in most games next up another game that caught my eye because of the gameplay and then a studio that caught my eye because it was pretty unique it's a studio out of greece called traptics.com so the two founders of the studio, a husband and wife, Mike Papagantangelou, Mike Papagantangelou from Greece and his wife were there and I met them both. It was pretty amazing, but they've got like a, I think 20, 25 people in their, I think about 20 people in their studio now. So it's, it's definitely a studio and they, they've made other games and this game called Homeseek again, hit close to home for me. It's a cross between sort of the survival and the city building genre. Uh -huh. A little bit more post-apocalyptic, a little bit more, uh, you know, these desolate wastelands and a little bit more focused on sort of like the city building and, you know, sort of like laying down the resources and organizing them so that you're sort of building up the, the, the world that you're, you're, you're fixing and, and creating this, this home for yourself. I'm very fascinated by the idea of what the game development scene is in Greece. So I traded, I've already traded emails with, with Mike um, and team. I hope to definitely speak with them more and will very likely get them on for an interview as well to both talk about the game and talk about the game development scene. It's, it's a striking looking right. set, setting. Right. They've done a great job in the art and the trailer They've, they made a cinematic for the trailer and it's very rich. It's, it's, I, they have to be using like Unreal 5 meta human or, or something for it because they've got a character and he's telling a story and it's really kind of cool looking. And then it's a little bit more of like the, the, it's the top down, you know, city builder kind of style and a little bit more technical and less amorphic artistic models as more, you know, more like hard, hard surface technical models. Uh -huh. which is something I really like uh, as uh, it, well, I, I like everything, but uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, this, I, I, I definitely like the style of, and they've done well with it. I mentioned earlier that I don't pick up swag and I didn't accept, this was another one where I had talked, uh, I had spent some time talking to Mike about their trip over and he gave me a little uh, giveaway package as well. 
Um, that was pretty amazing. So I wanted to call that out too. Uh, so it's this little tin box. Uh, it's a, it's monogram. It's got the home seek logo on it etched into it. It's actually etched into the metal. I it's this, this thing is amazing. And then just sort of as part of the theme, it's filled with these like little survival bits and pieces. There's a little, a little vial of water with their QR code, uh, tagged off of it so you could survive with your water uh a little uh survival pencil so you can draw your out your your i guess drawing your architecture of your base or whatever some little survival wristband a patch uh this little wooden card pops out and is a usb key with oh. their with their pr press kit on it very clever and it slides back together and it's etched with their name so they and then a little map which is their one pager on their game uh so uh, there's a little compass in this i mean they're swagging there. in their swag yes i i really ap appreciated that i i don't do like pins and stuff there's a lot of people collecting pins at at packs and getting buttons and i don't do that but this is something i'll put on the shelf and i like the little what they did on the inside that was clever Okay, and then to round out the the ten main ones that we picked out was another one that I I see it's a VR I see it's a VR game. It is a VR game, and it was also it seemed like kind of a big deal. And I tend to skip over the ones that are like if if EA was here and there was an EA booth, I I probably would skip over it. I'd, yeah. I'd probably maybe I'd poke my head in, maybe I'd ask you know who's who's there, but it's not like. The CEO of EA is not going to be hanging around to talk right. to. And it, very likely with somebody like EA, it might not even be any employees from the company. It might be like a, you know, a PR firm that's running the show for them. This one almost had the feel of that. And it's so well produced. I felt like it was, it was like some big deal, some big publisher you know, at, at first glance that had hired like an actor, acting crew to, pub, to put this out. So the game is Peaky Blinders, The King's Ransom VR Experience. So it's almost an episode of Peaky Blinders. It's very interactive. It's very high quality VR. So it's you put on the Oculus Rift 2. Uh, you, you, you're immersed in the world. Very you know, great textures. Very well done. Licensed all of the characters. They worked with the studio, the Peaky Blinders studio, to create it. Maze Theory, who is the developer of this, is an indie studio. So they are not huge. So they're an indie studio. I think, again, in the tens of people range. Uh, they've done a couple VR experiences before this. In fact, if, if it might be ones you want to look up, if you're a fan of Doctor Who, they did two Doctor Who experiences. One is a VR Doctor Who uh, tie-in. And the second one was a mobile game that sounded fascinating that I do want to check out, which is you start the game and it's as if you found a phone laying on the ground. And then you look at the phone and you're trying to figure out who it belongs to and get, you know, so you can get it back to the person. So the game that you're playing is this found phone experience, which sounds really clever. I talked to Russ Harding, the chief creative officer of Maze Theory. He was one of the founders of Maze Theory, the, the studio. He helped run Maze Theory. The studio before it was acquired in recent history, I think in the last year by a bigger company, a bigger games company called Emergent Enter Entertainment. But they're this, this indie studio developing this super high quality branded Peaky Blinders TV production. They're getting called by TV studios to maybe look at different bits of IP. And I spent a bunch of time talking to Russ uh, about this and it just sounds amazing. And they're also from the UK. Oh, so that whole idea of them seeming like it was a production company that had done this thing. No, they're just all actually British and they all have the, their appropriate accents and they were all dressed in, in costumes. Yes, the I saw that. Costumes. Uh, it was it was great. It, it, it really fit together. And anytime you heard them, it was just fun to just sit there and listen to them, you know, describe the game, give their elevator pitch on the game, because I'm not going to. I'm not going to do the accents because I will ruin it because they were actually doing it. They're it, it, wonderful to listen to. Um, so did you yeah. watch the Peaky Blinders show? I did not. I did not either. Uh, but it makes me want to. So yeah. I, I, but it, 
I'm a big VR fan. Yes. And even without being a fan of the TV show, I could see being a fan of the, of the, absolutely of just going through one of those kinds of VR story experiences like that. So very cool. One to watch coming out soon. Peaky Blinders VR and Maze Theory, the subsidiary of Emergent Entertainment is definitely one to watch as well. I think we're going to see some other big things coming out of, of them, especially as they get teamed up with more studios. He said at this point, because they've done a few of these, they have more people coming to them than them needing to go out and seek branded experiences like this, which is wonderful for them. Okay, so that was our 10. That was our main 10. I wanted to do, do a couple other shout outs to, to wrap it up. And it, again, that was a random sampling. So many other great ones. And that's why I want to do more shout outs as well. Um, one off the top of my head that I'll have to maybe get some video of as well. It's sort of deserving of it. Of all of like the, the hardware vendors that were that were there. And, and Intel has been at the last couple packs as well. Uh -huh. Intel is doing great work at, the, at these packs. Big booths. So you know that they're a big time sponsor. But it's been different every single PAX. They're engaging experiences. It's still showing off the Intel hardware and that kind of thing. One of the things that they had, which I did have video of that I'd captured, was uh, like once, once an hour on the hour, there's, there's a thing at PAX called uh, BYOC, bring your own computer. And it's an area blocked off in the back. And you pay, I think you only pay like 35 bucks for all, you know, it covers all four days. And you get a spot reserved at a table that you can bring your own PC and it's, they've got security that, that watches that place and just can keep it there for four days. You can have like a home base and a place to play games, play games with your friends, your PC. So people, a lot of people bring like their, their full PC, their tower case, and they, they wow. pop it off and they play there. So what Intel was doing was like at least a couple of times, I don't know if it was every hour, but at least a couple of times a day, they went to the BYOC they found someone with an older PC and they said, hey, would it be okay if we upgraded your PC? Oh my gosh. And so then they took them over to a stage and they got on stage with them in the middle of the studio and they ran this little, and the, the woman who was doing the, the upgrades was basically, you know, like cracked their, their PC case open. It's, it's, you know, let's yank out this motherboard. We're going to put this one in. We're going to give you this new graphics card. And you know, putting, you know, plugging the pieces back together here, you want to help. And she was, she was like, uh, let me check your work. And it was <laughs> very interactive, very fun, uh, great experience. So good job, Intel. Really appreciate what they do. I do have some pictures out there, uh, which you can see in the video of, they always have cool case builds. They're featuring partners as well. Uh, so You're supporting the community and the business, the industry. Yes. Yeah. Which is good for them That's, and yeah. something that they should do. But uh, again, also different every time. So they're putting a lot of work into it every time and it shows. So thank you, Intel. Two publishers. So there's a, a bunch of publishers. In fact, I couldn't find, I think I had to make a private reservation. They weren't on the show floor or Apogee. I like Apogee as a publisher as an example. So we've interviewed a couple indies in this past year from apogee they're great but i couldn't find them this year i think they might have been there like in a suite at the one of the hotels and i couldn't track them down two publishers that i did get to meet up with in more detail and meet a couple of the leads from were quali who i mentioned which was the wild mender game and Crytivo. and Crytivo has a few different games uh there uh that that we've that i've been keeping my eye on in fact another survival game that I'm going to dig into called uh, Below Snakes. I think it's be Below Snakes or Beneath Snakes, <laughs> something like that. Uh, small More later indie, on that one. <laughs> right, small indie team from Germany. Um, but but Crytivo, really great. And I met Alex uh, Kosh, Koshelkov, the CEO of Crytivo. So there's just some guy standing there. I'm like, oh, you know, what was, what's your favorite of the indies that are, are here? And, oh, and, and what was your name? And he's like, oh, here's my card. And I'm like, oh, you're the CEO of Cartivo. <laughs> Very nice to meet you. I've been in your Discord for a while. I've been following the games that you publish. You're floating to the top of my list as one of those indie publishers to watch. So that was great. And then, as I mentioned, Quali was, was excellent. 
So not only the games that they showed up and Wild Mender that they were supporting there, but I met uh, uh, one of their product marketing and, and writers, because uh, Quali also does some of their own games, mostly on the mobile platforms, a guy named Jack Richardson. And then I also met, who I think we may talk to a little bit more, uh, Matthew Barter, who's recently come on in the last few months at Quali as the ambassador and content manager. So basically what he's responsible for is social media. He started a podcast. He's asked, we, we chatted for a while because he was asking me about like the podcasting and, and how that's going. And we traded some notes. And so, and so Matthew seems like a, a, a great fun person. So hopefully hear more from Matthew as well. So Kowali, Kritivo, Apogee, and Brace Yourself, and Finji. So those are, those are some of the top ones that, that I'm uh, keeping my eye on, especially the four that were on the show floor, Kowali, Kritivo, Brace Yourself, and Finji, that I really like in terms of publishers. A uh, couple other quick shout outs. A game that Corley has got his eye on is a game called Gigabash from Malaysia by Passion Republic Games. Gigabash is a brawler fighter game where you are kaiju, which is, you know, Godzilla and Mothra. And so they, they've actually got the license to, I think, like four or five of the main oh, yeah. kaiju characters. And that's so uh, Corley. Yes. Corley is a big Godzilla fan. Uh, Godzilla lore and memorabilia and and stuff. So big, big time thumbs up from Corley on that one. Uh, and they're from Malaysia. Again, we, we've had a developer on from Malaysia. Uh, so we heard more about the games development scene there. One to watch. Another one to watch, which I liked because it was stylistic and cool looking and a little bit more chill and a little bit more on the survival side is a game called Me, My Mech, and I. And I met Joey Badger, the creative director. And what Me, My Mech, and I brings to the table is it's a garden. It's more of a garden simulator than a survival simulator. Okay. And it's it's post-apocalyptic, but the half the game, the, the, the background of everything in the game, except the mech, looks kind of like Stardew Valley. You know, so it's more pixel and you've got like a little right. house and there's a shop cat and you can interact with the cat. And then you're going out into the garden and you're, and you're, you're tending the garden. But the way you tend the garden is with a mech. And it's, you know, like a, you climb into the mech and then the mech is realized as a 3D model. So the, the mech is painted and it, so you get this mix of the 3D model in the pixel world. That's a really cool mixed balance and it, and it works really well. Interesting idea. And it's, it's swords to plowshares. So the mech, his guns have been turned into water cannons to water the plants. And his, you know, his, his blaster is now a plow to, you know, to, to dig up the rows and, and, and shoot, he shoots seeds into the ground. <laughs> and the little mech abilities. So very, very cool, cool looking, one to early in development. So we'll have to see how it evolves, but also uh, cool looking. Another quick shout out to Loveless Studios, Lovelace Studios. So uh, that's, uh, I, everyone recognizes that name from one of the, the founders of computer programming, Ada Loveless, Lovelace, Lo how, why am I <laughs> pronouncing that? <laughs> Ada Lovelace, one of the found, one of the originators, the pioneers, the giants whose shoulders we stand on in computer programming back in right. the, uh, ba back in the day. So the studio, Lovelace Studio, is founded by Kayla Komali, who's the CEO and co-founder, and Alex Engel, Engel, who she teamed up with. Alex is a veteran of the industry. Kayla it was more of an engineer and wanted to bring some of these skills and advanced technology from engineering and high tech into the games industry. So right. this is going to be a studio to, to watch. They're more building like platforms and tools although it's, it's an open world environment where you can sort of explore some of the things that they've built. Think, think kind of the kinds of things that would make the metaverse really work, which is uh, procedurally generated uh, environments that are next, next generation and very tactile that you can create uh, more dynamically so that you could create a, a, meta a metaverse world that could connect to other metaverse worlds. Uh -huh. That and using tools like ChatGPT to exp exp 
expand the kind of content, the language interaction models and those kinds of things that you can make available on those platforms. So tools to build those next gen games, they're going to be developing that as a platform and tool set. And then I imagine it would take a couple of years to see the games that would grow out of that. But this is definitely one I want to keep an eye on. Another one that was great, that was exciting and interesting early in development, but a, a really fun guy I met who's the, the lead developer of a small team did, I think, a lot of it himself to start, Sean Heron. The game is called Primal Omen. So what Primal Omen is, is like a first person shooter adventure. Imagine sort of Jurassic Park. So it's, oh, it's okay. post-apocalyptic Jurassic Park, but it's on like a future version of Hawaii. So it's really brightly lit and, you know, like bright colors and there's still dinosaurs coming to eat you. You know, <laughs> that, that's the whole kind of, he described it as, you know, the whole kind of clever girl scene. Uh, that's, that's the setup. Uh, but, but a little bit of survival, a little bit of like base building, you got to like build a base and like build a house. So a little, little bit of survival going on. And a, a lot of the sort of first person run and gun to save yourself, go hunt dinosaurs kind Great. Of thing going on. Early in development, looking kind of cool. Going to want to watch, see how that one develops. Another one definitely in the survival, more almost, almost leaning more towards the, the rust survival genre that's very early in development. Not very early, but in, early in development is called Feudal Lands. So Feudal Lands was there looking very interesting. Another one I want to keep an eye on. They were very early build. In fact, it was one of their first alpha builds. They were just getting up and running on the servers and they didn't even have it up and running the first day. So very early, but some different twists, uh, different twists on the survival genre. You're in like swords and, you know, so swords and shields and uh, castle building and siege engine kind of the uh -huh. version of survival. And then you have all of these like peasants and townspeople that can be part of your team that you make part of your little feudal land that then you, you use have to, to sacrifice them people. eventually. No, you're not a <laughs> lamb. Uh, uh, and you, yes, you, you, you may be able to sacrifice it to the cult of the lamb uh, <laughs> as one does, but not in feudal lands. So those are really great. And then a uh, final shout out to Indie Games Poland. Indie Games Poland had their booth and too many games to mention, but track these guys down. Uh, in fact, I should pick out a game or two. Vo Voo Dolls, I think is Vo Vo a combination of Voodoo and Dolls. I think it's called Voo Dolls. Very cool looking, fun, artistic game. But the variety of games that you get out of this collection of indie publishers coming out of Poland and the quality that's coming out of some of these, there's going to be some gems that we're going to, and I, there's going to be some breakout hits. I, I know we're going to see. So indie games, Poland, and then just the, the Poland indie scene is just blowing up because of all of the talent from CD project red. Right. And so we had our interview with Joanna, with Joanna that dug into that a little bit. Definitely worth hearing more about in the future. I mean, I have a couple of like general questions about pack East Pax East. Yes. This now year. is the time for the questions, Seema. <laughs> so you, you know, in our year list of 10, you had one VR game. Would you say that was about the numbers that you saw there? Like for every 10, 10 10? games, there was one one or so VR games or less or more or? Maybe about, uh, I, yeah, no, about that. I, I would say, because if, I mean, especially if you're counting like, you know, you get a, a booth like Critivo, which really had, you know, like eight indie studios in their booth. So that out of 100, maybe 10. Uh, and, and there's probably even more than 100 that were represented there. So out of 200, maybe 10 VR experiences. There was, they were there. There was a handful of them and there was new interesting ones to try. There's a VR bowling game that I had actually seen last year uh, that they had done some more work on. It was closer to release. Uh, That's interesting, VR bowling, yeah. Yeah, straight up, straight up VR bowling. Just, just grab the, you know, just at a bowling lane in a bowling alley, you grab the ball and you bowl. <laughs> it seems to me like the <laughs> VR cool. games that we've seen that were, well, I could be wrong about this, that we've seen that were, narr you know, narrative style games, there's always something like it's crime or um, sci-fi or horror or whatever. I wonder, you know, like a 
VR Animal Crossing or something <laughs> is coming. It's the VR space, the VR tech is in a little bit of an interesting spot right now. I think maybe when the next generation of VR headsets become available and become a little bit more widespread, the diversity of games that you'll be able to be easily bit. build on those platforms will expand. Yeah. Um, there are those kinds of games where you can have a little bit more like top-down control. Uh, Demio is a, like a collectible card, digital card game. That's actually very cool. They have a, a VR aspect of that where you can have four people sitting at a table. Everybody puts on VR headsets and then the, the VR experience becomes your card game on the table with animated figures on the board in the middle of you. So, but then again, we need the platforms to develop a little bit more. We need the hardware to develop a little bit more. The poly count, what you're able to do in the platform is less, is much lower than what you can do on any other platform right now. So it's a lower common denominator. It makes it harder to build some of those kinds of games you might want to make with, you know, a little more intricate models and lots of furniture right. and that kind of thing. I didn't really realize that. Okay. Yeah. And also I wonder, did you see any Steam decks there? Yes. So we saw a fair number of, of people with Steam, desk, Steam decks, but in a very clever move, there were a bunch of studios. In fact, the I think at least half the Poland Indies booth seemed to be running their games, their demo experiences off of Steam Deck. Okay. That's so, interesting. Because you need to bring, if you're a, a, a pub, yeah, if, you publisher, gotta, if you need to have a booth, you need to bring PCs, you need to bring hardware that you're going to be showing your stuff off on. Right. So when I used to do this for shows and we'd be showing off tech demos, we were using Intel NUX. And Intel has some great versions of a NUC, but they're kind of like bigger. They're like the size of a loaf of bread. Uh, but they've got high-end graphics. You, you could run anything off of those. You can't run anything off of a Steam Deck and a Steam Deck's resolution and graphics it's is a little, a little bit more, more niche, yeah. But a bunch of games just run using those as the hardware to run the experience. Because you can hook up a keyboard, a video, a monitor, and a mouse and have the Steam Deck sort of even like behind the scenes or, you know, or, or, yeah. or behind the wall. And it's a very portable, nice platform. And I had my Steam Deck around the whole time. I really only used it in the hotel and on the plane. And I really only played No Man's Sky for whatever I reason. I mean, did you play No Man's Sky on the plane? Yes, <laughs> both ways. On the plane. I thought, I thought I saw that happening. No Man's Sky right now for me, because I started a new save specifically for the Steam Deck, it, if I just want something chill to relax and have a little adventure and exploration with some goals in mind, No Man's Sky just hooks me in still yeah. for, for that kind of thing. And yeah. it's perfect for me on the Steam Deck. There's not like Star Wars The Old Republic is playable on the Steam Deck, but difficult. Yeah. No Man's Sky, the controls are just right there for me. I don't play a lot of games with controllers, so I'm not really used to it. I loaded uh, Witcher 3, which you can play with a controller, onto the Steam Deck, and it seemed to work. But it's not just not as comfortable and easy for me to get into if I just want something no-brainer just to play with as No Man's Sky. So in the hotel rooms at night, uh, uh, here and there, and on the plane both ways, I was doing No Man's Sky. All right. Well, there's our rundown. I hope. And I expect we're going to get a bunch of these things that we talked about as interviews coming up on the show. I hope so, too. Really looking forward to that. There's a lot of great people that both Corley, Corley and I got to talk to. I really appreciate John's time coming out there, guiding me in the process and helping collect notes and direct where we should be spending our time and attention. And really appreciate all the people that I, I had a chance to meet and talk to. Some, some really amazing people. Uh, the interview that we're going to have coming out next week is not about PAX to start, but it's from a professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And he, uh, the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, I got to visit while I was in Boston because there was a little meetup on the side with a bunch of students showing off their projects. That was really cool. Uh, so great town also. Fine, you know, final shout out maybe just to Boston itself. That Boston Seaport District, I went out for a run on the, in, on the seaport along the harbor every day, even though it was colder and even rainy one day. Boston is a nice, especially that area, it's just a nice town, beautiful town, built up, new apartments and condos being built right on the waterfront, 
great restaurants at cool, cool place. Great town. Go yeah. visit Boston. Love Boston. All right. I think we can wrap that up for today. And Sounds like a great trip. see some interviews soon and we maybe look forward to PAX West in the fall. I look right. forward. Okay. Talk to you later. This has been a New Overlords production. For more, please visit newoverlords.com for video, subscribe and feed links, and other ways to help the show.